Introduction Yet another edition of the Bhagavad Gita and yet another accompanying introduction that strains to justify it. Let us deal with this worldly very sight by doing nothing but then quoting the concluding words of Sanjaya, the Gita's narrator. O King, recalling again and again this wonderful and sacred conversation between Krishna and Arjuna, I am thrilled at every moment. Bhagavad Gita 18.76 New insights into this unfathomable divine conversation are always welcome. The Son of God has been studied for centuries, lending itself to interpretations of all kinds. Academic, ecological, psychological, sociological, political and popular. Though its wisdom has been identified with the perennial philosophy, it speaks on many levels to its varied congregation, primarily about life's ultimate necessity, self-realization within the context of God-realization. Krishna's speech is said to be Vavaduka, which means that it is ambrosial and pleasing to the ears. Krishna himself is described as Satyavak because his words never prove to be false. In his conversation with Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna's ambrosial speech and the truth of his message are apparent. It is no wonder that his words have been immoralized in human society, where he descends to express himself in the fullness of love. Although some devotees have tried to establish the historicity of Krishna's appearance 5,000 years ago, as well as events that are said to have taken place at that time, such as the Gita's Kurukshetra war, they have not made much progress in documenting physical evidence. Where devotees have succeeded is in recording their own extraordinary mystical experiences of Krishna and the theological and the philosophical ramifications of these experiences are a spiritual reality that human society must recon with. Krishna represents the law of life of the Absolute, while Buddha taught wisdom leading to the sensation of suffering and Christ salvation through love, Krishna is God in love, living in eternity with his devotees. Devotees of Krishna embody five basic types of love, passive adoration, shantarasa, servitude, dasyarasa, friendship, sakyarasa, parental affection, vatsalya rasa, and romantic love, madurya rasa. These five basic expressions of devotional love, bhakti rasa, may also overlap, and each has its own subdivisions. Arjuna of the Gita loves Krishna as a friend, with an admixture of servitude. His friendly relationship with Krishna is called Pura Sambandi, and is specific to Krishna's city, Lila, divine play, as opposed to Krishna's more intimate, pastoral Raja Lila. Among all of Krishna's city friends, Arjuna is most prominent. Before coming to the big city of Mathura and later establishing his capital at Dwaraka, Krishna was raised in Raja. The setting of Raja 
represents the beauty of simplicity, the beauty of the natural environment. Krishna's father was a herdsman and Krishna himself a cowherder, decorated with ornaments from the forest, its flowers, leaves and multicolored clays, and crowned with the conjurer's peacock plum, this Krishna, his only weapon, the flute, is said to be Krishna in his fullness, Swayam Bhagavan. He is God when God wants to be himself, relaxing in the company of his intimate devotees, forgetful of even his own godhood to facilitate this intimacy. This Krishna is the connoisseur of love, yet subjugated by his lover, Radha. Footnote 1. Radha is Krishna's primal Shakti. She is in the shine of the Krishna sun. He is the supreme object of love and she is the abode of supreme love. As all avatars of Godhead issue from Krishna, similarly all of their counterhole concerts emanate from Radha and partially represent her. In the language of India's East Editions, Raja Krishna, subjugated by Radha's love, is the most perfect, Purnatama, Dira Lalita Naika, and as such is in no mood to speak Upanishadic wisdom. Footnote 2. There are four basic hero, Naika types in classic Indian drama and poetry. The Dira Lalita Naika is described in BLS 2.1.230. Thus, a person who is very genuine and always youthful, expert in joking without anxiety, and always subjugated by his girlfriends, is called Dira Lalita Naika. In secular drama and poetry, Cupid is considered the ideal Dira Lalita Naika. Krishna of the Gita, while the same person as Krishna of Raja, is in a very different mood, as is the case with all his moods, his emotional makeup in the Bhagavad Gita Lila is relative to the nature of his accompanying devotee's love. Once he leaves Raja on his mission to establish Dharma, Krishna is surrounded by devotees who have a great awareness of his godhood. Footnote 3 Here, Dharma refers to the Avatara's mission to establish scriptural codes. See Bhagavad Gita 4.7-8 Once he leaves Raja on his mission to establish Dharma, Krishna is surrounded by devotees who have a greater awareness of his godhood. This sense distances them from him slightly, introducing formalities into their dealings not found in his relationships with the devotees of Raja. In the city, Krishna, the village adolescent, matures into eternal youthfulness. He becomes a judicious prince, peaceful, humble and wise. In the aesthetic language of Bharata Muni, he is the perfect Purna Dira Prashanta Naika. Footnote 4 Bharata Muni is considered to be the founder of Indian aesthetic theory, the legendary author of Nadya Shastra. Footnote 5. The Dira Prashantanaika is described in BRS 2.1.232 thus. Peaceful, tolerant of miseries, judicious and humble. 
Such is the dearer Prashanta Naika. It is this Krishna who speaks Gita Upanishad, the Bhagavad Gita. From the Bhagavad Gita, we come to know of Krishna's divinity. In the light of this knowledge, his village life takes one new meaning. The informal simplicity of the Viraja Leela is like a black backdrop that causes the valuable jewel of Krishna to shine that much more. God's acting like a human to the extent that he falls in love, as does Krishna with Radha, is indeed a sweet and charming expression of his divinity, one that gives us a clue as to how to approach him, such that he becomes easily accessible to us. When the Absolute is overcome by love, he manifests a transcendental need that arises not from inadequacy, but from the fullness of love. The nature of love is such that it causes one to feel both full and in need of sharing one's fullness. Krishna becomes most accessible to anyone acquainted with his inner necessity to share his love. This is the sacred secret of the Upanishads, to which Sri Gita ultimately points. While establishing the general principles of Dharma, Krishna reveals the glory of Brahma Dharma, the Dharma of love itself. Footnote 6 This term refers to the love exhibited in Krishna's Raja Leela. This edition of the Bhagavad Gita follows the tradition of Gaudiya Vedanta. It is the Gaudiyas, disciples of Sri Chaitanya, who first conceived of explaining the Upanishadic subject matter in the language of aesthetics. Drawing on the Taitiriya Upanishad's dictum Rasu Vai Saha, the Absolute is aesthetic rapture, Rupa Goswami proceeded to elaborate on the heart of the Absolute, indeed on its love life. He envisions the Absolute as the perfect lover, the irresistible Krishna of the sacred literature, and explains Krishna's complexities with startling insight. To date, no one has even attempted to tell us more about the personality of Godhead. Since Krishna of Raja is the original of God's incarnations, the feature of Godhead in which all others are included, the Gaudias have mostly written about him. Their commentaries on the Srimad Bhagavatam are well known as are many of their original compositions. However, they have also written on the Upanishads, where the love sports of Krishna are, if at all present, well concealed. Baladeva Vidyabhushana wrote Govindabhasya, the Gaudiya commentary on the Vedanta Sutras of Padaranaya Vyasa, in which he seeks to demonstrates the concordance of Shruti, the Upanishads, with Gaudiya theory. He also wrote a commentary on the Bhagavad Gita, as did his predecessor, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. Before them, Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami cited the Gita more than 30 times in his classic Chaitanya Charitamrita, and his predecessor, Jiva Goswami, cited it profusely in his seminal Sat Sandarbha. Evidently, Dira Prashanta Krishna of the Gita is quite relevant to devotees of Dira Lalita Krishna. 
Vishwanath Chakravarti was the first in the Gaudiya lineage to write the entire commentary on the Gita. He is most well known for his highly esoteric explanations of the inner significance of Krishna's leelas of love with the gopis of Raja. Yet it would seem that he found it important to remind us that Gopi Krishna is, after all, God, even when suppressing this aspect of himself for the sake of his intimate leelas. We must first understand the metaphysical truth, tattva, concerning Krishna as the source of the world and all souls before we forget the world and lose ourselves in divine love of Krishna. Among the sacred texts of the Hindus, no book is better suited to give this teaching than the Bhagavad Gita. Known also as Gita Upanishad, due to its having been spoken directly by God himself, Bhagavad Gita is the essence of the Upanishads. Footnote 7 The Upanishads are thought to have issued directly from God. If one wants to understand the entirety of the thousand of verses in the Upanishadic canon, one need only understand the 700 verses of the Bhagavad Gita. While the Upanishads are often thought to be more philosophical than religious, it is significant that this balance is reversed in the Gita Upanishad. It possesses a religio-philosophical meta-narrative in which a mystical life of direct spiritual experience emerges. Perhaps the most significant thing about the Gita is its inclusive nature, in which no particular doctrine is condemned, but each finds its place in a hierarchy of spiritual practices and transcendence. Worship of God is never transcended in the Gita. It takes the form of unalloyed devotion, surpassing even knowledge of both the soul and the Godhood of Godhead. It thus brings us to the door of Raja Bhakti. Popular understanding holds that the Upanishads reveal a formless impersonal absolute approached through the wisdom of introspection as opposed to religious ritual. In this view, devotion can be useful but it is ultimately dispensed with. By popular understanding, I am referring to the Advaita Vedanta of Shankara and those who hold Neo-Advaitin views. Acceptance of Shankara's basic understanding of Hindu sacred literature is so widespread that many make no distinction between the two. They think that the Advaitin doctrine of Shankara is Vedanta, unaware of the fact that Advaita Vedanta is only one strand of Vedanta philosophy, one that differs radically from the other principal schools. Footnote 8 Vishisht Advaita, Dvaita, Dvait Advaita, Shud Advaita, and Ajindya Veda Abeda. Of the five devotional schools, that of the Gaudias is the most recent, and thus has the distinct advantage of being able to draw on the devotional wealth that came before it. The host of commentators in the devotional schools of Vedanta that followed Shankara have all vociferously refuted his doctrines. Doctrines that include dispensing with God, the individual soul and the world, as well as 
subjugating devotion to knowledge, all in the name of non-duality. While the devotional commentators may have subtle theological differences that demarcate their particular schools of Vedanta, they are in sufficient agreement with one another to unanimously oppose these doctrines of Shankara. Among the devotional commentaries of the Gita, Ramanujas is the first, and thus the most influential. It has made significant inroads in academic circles. Ramanujas commentary is brilliant in its demonstration of the congruity of the Gita's many paths and the post-liberated nature of devotion. In some places I have cited Ramanuja's commentary or followed his sense of the text. This is in keeping with Chiva Goswami's policy of acknowledging venerable Vaishnavas, as discussed in his Tattva Sandarbha. I have cited Sridhar Swami's Subodhini in the same spirit. Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur and Baladeva Vidyabhushana have referred to Ramanuja but seem more influenced by Sridhar Swami, whose commentary they often follow closely. This attests to the influence of Sridhar Swami on the Gaudiya school already well documented in the case of Srimad Bhagavatam. Footnote 9. See Chaitanya Charitamrita Antya 7.133. Also relevant to the present work is Advaitin Madhusudana Saraswati's Gudarta Deepika commentary on Bhagavad Gita, which Vishwanath Chakravarti cites numerous times. Footnote 10. Madhusudana Saraswati was a junior contemporary of Sri Chaitanya, yet never met him. It is apparent that he was influenced by Gaudiya Vedanta enough to regard it as a viable alternative to Advaita, the doctrine of his own choice. In the interest of substantiating the plausibility of the Gaudiya understanding of the Gita, I have cited Madhusudana Saraswati's commentary in places. As new Advaitins may think the Gaudiya rendering forced in places, it will be useful for them to know that such a highly renowned scholar and guru of the Advaita lineage is often supportive of the Gaudiya interpretations of the flow of Sri Gita's verse and its emphasis on devotion. The commentaries of Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur and Baladeva Vidyabhushana in the Gaudiya lineage are in comparison to Ramanuja's commentary far less known. True, to their devotion to the sweet Krishna of Raja, their explanation of the Gita brings a charm to the text that Ramanujas does not. Moreover, they place greater emphasis on devotion both in terms of its power to afford the highest salvation and in its magnanimity in extending itself to the lowest section of society. I have cited these two principal Gaudiya commentators throughout, and naturally I am primarily indebted to them. Although Sri Vishwanath and Baladeva Vidyabhushana occasionally differ, their differences remain within the parameters of the lineage's devotional conclusions, Siddhanta. These two have elaborately demonstrated from their knowledge of Sanskrit and the entire corpus of sacred literature instances 
in which some verses can take on a special meaning that is hidden from the vision of those whose eyes have not been tinged with the solve of love of Krishna. Perhaps Gaudiya commentators appear to go out on a limb more than anywhere else when they find Raj Krishna speaking in the Gita. Footnote 11 Vishwanath Chakravarti hears Krishna speaking of Raganuga Bhakti in Bhagavad Gita 10.9. Bhakti Vinod Thakur and several other modern commentators follow his lead in their commentaries. According to Gaudiya theology, the Vira Prashanta Krishna of the Gita is not preoccupied with Raja and the love of the gopis. As much as the Dira Lalita Krishna of Raja is in no mood for an Upanishadic discourse, Dira Prashanta Krishna of Dwaraka is typically not in the mood of Raja Bhakti. However, careful study of the Srimad Bhagavatam in conjunction with the Padma and Harivamsha Puranas reveals that the prince of the Gita does occasionally think of Raja, as he did in Kurukshetra during his first visit to this sacred place. According to Srimad Bhagavatam 1.11.9, Krishna returned to Mathura to kill Dantavakra before the Gita was spoken. Padma Purana reveals that he then went from Mathura to Raja Dharma. Footnote 12 Padma Purana Uttara Kanta 279 after remaining in Raja for two months, he transferred all of his Raja devotees to his unmanifest eternal Leela of Goloka. According to Vishwanath Chakravarti's comments on the Padma Purana, Krishna himself went in a nearly complete Purnakalpa Prakaja manifestation to Goloka. In another, most complete Purnatama Prakaja, plenary manifestation, he remained perpetually enjoying in Raja, invisible to material eyes. In yet another planetary manifestation, Purna Prakaja, he mounted his chariot and returned alone to Dwaraka. Following his return, Krishna spoke Bhagavad Gita. This prince of Dwaraka, no doubt, thought of the highest devotion of his Raja devotees from time to time while speaking of devotion to Arjuna. Indeed, as mentioned earlier, the entire Leela of Dwaraka is not unrelated to Raja. Krishna went to Dwaraka for the sake of protecting his Raja devotees. As Sanatan Goswami finds Dwaraka's prince calling out Radha's name in his sleep in his Priyat Bhagavatam Rita 1.6.51-52, Gaudiya commentators have heard him speak of Raja Bhakti by reading between the lines of his song to Arjuna. Indeed, even within the embrace of his principal queen of Dwaraka, Prince Krishna thinks of Raja and Radha's love. Umapati Tara, quoted in Rupa Goswami's Padyavali 371 and Ujvala Nilamani 14.184, prays thus. In his palace in Dvaraka, on the sparkling gem-strewn shores of the ocean, Krishna's body shivered with ecstasy in the tight embrace 
of none other than Rukmini. Yet his mind recalled the fragrance of the love he had enjoyed with Radha in the reeds by the banks of the black Jamuna waters, and he fainted. May that faint protect you always. Ultimately, the theological resolution to the apparent contradiction in which Rajabhakti issues from the lips of the prince of Dwaraka lies in the power of Bhakti itself. Devotees see Krishna in everyone and everything by the force of their love for him. Sri Chaitanya is said to have made the statement, Mora mana Vrindavana, my mind is Vrindavana, Vraja. He saw all rivers as the Vraja's Yamuna, all mountains as its Govardhan. In the majestic Jagannath deity of Sridam Puri, he saw Raja's sweet Dira Lalita Krishna, flute in hands, head adorned with peacock feather. Footnote 13. See Chaitanya Charitamrita Antya 16.85. In consideration of this, it is hardly a stretch for his devotees to hear Raja Krishna, the Dira Lalita of Radha, in princely Krishna's words. The gap is further narrowed by the fact that on the battleground of sacred Kurukshetra, long before he spoke the Gita to Arjuna, Krishna met with Radha and the gopis after a long and painful period of separation. Footnote 14. See Srimad Bhagavatam 10.78. Setting foot again in that holy place for the purpose of instructing Arjuna, Prince Krishna was no doubt influenced by that memory. Thus, in the midst of his discourse to Arjuna on comparative religion, in which Bhakti effortlessly rises to the top as the cream of the milk of religion, it is natural for Arjuna's charioteer to steer the conversation in the direction of Raja and the highest expression of devotion. The idea that the spiritual emotion, bhava, of the Gaudiya commentators brings their interpretation of the Gita to the pitch of Raja's bhakti is charming. The feeling that prejudices their vision is by no means a blemish. After all, it is feeling for the Gita and love of Krishna that the text seeks to arouse in its readers. Their feeling for Krishna arising out of a firm philosophical and scriptural foundation is the most valuable thing one can hope to experience in the course of studying Bhagavad Gita. In feeling their emotion, readers will also get the feel of the Gita and thus feeling for Krishna. After the time of Baladeva Vidyabhushana, who passed from the world in the mid-18th century, the Bhagavad Gita became somewhat neglected in the Gaudiya school until the time of Bhaktivinod Thakur, the great revivalist of the tradition in the late 19th century. Thakur Bhaktivinod published two different Bengali editions of the Gita based on the two great Sanskrit commentaries that came before him. Bhaktivinod Thakur's son and successor, Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati, continued the Thakur's preaching mission and recognized the necessity of translating the Gita into English. 
of his disciples, Bhakti Ridoi Bon Maharaja, was the first to publish a translation and commentary in the Gaudiya spirit. His translation, the Gita, as a Chaitanyaite reads it, is based on Vishwanath Chakravarti's commentary. Bon Maharaja's commentary was followed by Bhakti Pradipa Tirtha Maharaja's English edition. The most influential Gaudiya Vaishnava edition was written by my own spiritual master, Srila A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, whose Bhagavad Gita, as it is, has sold more copies than any other edition to date. Srila Prabhupada's translation is dedicated to Baladeva Vidyabhushana. His indebtedness to Baladeva is clear throughout his English purports. My Shiksha Guru, Bhakti Rakshak Sridhar Deva Goswami, also published a translation of the Gita based on Vishwanath Chakravarti's commentary, in which he reveals the underlying esoteric understanding of Raja Bhakti. In the present edition, I have adopted a more literal translation of the original Sanskrit text, keeping the Gaudiya purport confined to the commentary. I have also taken pains to demonstrate the congruity of the Gita, its natural flow from verse to verse, which has not been a focus of other modern Gaudiya commentators. I have occasionally cited references to the Gita from the Sad Sandarva of Jiva Goswami and Chaitanya Charitamrita of Krishna Das Kaviraja Goswami, both of which precede the earliest Gaudiya Bhagavad Gita commentary. And I have also cited a number of Baladeva Vidyabhushana's references to the Gita in his Govindabhasya commentary on Vedanta Sutra. The language is contemporary, and as much as possible, I have tried to bring home the relevance of the Gita and the Gaudiya import in particular for the times in which we live. In all of this, I hope that this edition will serve as a meaningful contribution for the Gaudiya lineage, an indicator of its vitality at the beginning of the 21st century. While I am hopeful that both practitioners and casual readers will find this edition helpful, I initially undertook this work for my own edification and purification. In this I feel that my work has been a success, as it has given rise in me to real feeling for the Gita, Krishna and Arjuna. It is this feeling that I have attempted to weave into the text. May its careful study awaken spiritual sentiment in its readers as well, for it is this feeling that does not allow one to tire from hearing Krishna's ambrosial words, edition after edition, thrilled at every moment.